Coming your way on Art Rocks, a ceramicist giving customers something to smile about, often at the crack of dawn. Capturing the spare landscapes of the northern woods, one man's poster collection comes into the light. And getting to the heart of William Shakespeare through, what else, the theatre. That's all about to happen on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, back with another installment of Art Rocks. Breakfast amongst bees, butterflies and water birds. Dangling a little bit of Louisiana from your Christmas tree. Baton Rouge ceramicist Garda Hennigan makes things that encourage viewers to appreciate the wild things in a different medium. But before she could do that, this Lebanese native had to adapt to her strange new homeland and the creatures that call it home. Here's her story. I was born and raised in Lebanon. It's a small and beautiful country in the Middle East, in a small village called Saidun. I grew up in a time where the things we needed, most often they were handmade, from bread to clothes to bed sheets, even toys sometimes. My mother was a seamstress and she was very meticulous. My father was a builder, but his real passion was making things. So after he retired, he started making small tables from collected stones and scraps of wood, and they were great. I was making miniature furniture from used card boxes, and I used to sew clothes for my doll. So my whole world as a child was outdoors play time or indoors crafting time. And it was great, it was the best. As a child, I've never been introduced to clay or never seen clay in my life. And after high school, I went to college and I kept switching majors until I finally graduated with sacred art degree. During my studies of sacred art, I was introduced to clay for the first time. I took one course of ceramics, but I never thought I would work with clay again. So after I graduated, I went to a 9 to 5 regular job. Later, my sister, she's a nun and an artist, uh, she asked me to work with her. She wanted uh, to expand the embroidery studio and add ceramics. And of course I said, yes, I was so excited. Uh, she knew I didn't know much about clay, but she took the chance, and I became a potter by chance. The studio was only one room, there was a big embroidery, a noisy machine, and we didn't have even a table for me. So we put two chairs and a piece of wood, and I worked there on that thing. But a little bit at a time, we had a kiln, we had a bigger studio, I had as many tables as I want, and it developed a little bit at a time, and it became like a big studio. So I worked there with her for five and a half years, and I was making religious items, but never functional pots. My only resource uh, was books and experimentation, and this is how I learned. Just reading books, experimenting, and just getting better at it, a little bit at a time. After I came to the United States, I was like so surprised and fascinated by the ceramics world and how they teach it in college. I've been here since 2006 and I established my own studio in the dining room like you see behind me since the end of 2007 and I've been working with clay ever since. I had to start all over again making functional pottery. I started taking ceramics online classes and I attended uh, the visiting artist workshop at LSU in the ceramics studio. So those two things were really helpful in establishing my career as a potter plus the uh, tremendous support of my husband. I didn't have a wheel, so I started by hand building. Later on, uh, my husband and brothers, they got me a wheel for Christmas, and I put it on the kitchen counter when I need to work on the wheel. But since I didn't have space for the wheel all the time to just keep it there and work whenever I want to, I started to just hand build more stuff, and then I got used to it, and now I like it more because the pace of hand building is so slow, meditative. 
I can control it better. My focus is mainly on functional parts, so I make mugs. plates but I also make some decorative things like vases wall art and ornaments Most of my illustrations are um, inspired by my childhood memories and stories from my childhood, like some of the animals that I draw. I had like a personal connection with these things from back then, back in Lebanon. I also draw my inspiration from nature's forms and textures and from what I see around me and of course from living in Louisiana. For example, when I first started going to markets, people would ask me, do you have any Louisiana design? I would say, no, I didn't feel it yet. I was still adjusting and when I don't feel something, I can't make it. So it took me eight years to live here, to feel like it's really home. And suddenly out of nowhere, I found myself just drawing the pelicans and the bee. And even the pelican and the bees, they have connection to Lebanon too. And I like this applique technique that you can like cut something and it's also called sprigs in clay terms that you make something out of a shallow mold and then you apply it to the piece when it's still not too dry and I like to use different kind of technique for decorating because my process is mostly about decorating and about illustration and about texture. After a few years of using different glazes I finally settled on um, those translucent bright color glazes because they show the texture and all the drawings that I put underneath. So I can at the same time draw, put texture, highlight the texture and use those translucent glazes to show everything that I drew or all the texture I put on my parts. And I like that. The ceramic process for me doesn't get easy. It's a long process from making, decorating, drying, firing, then glazing, then firing again. Plus, working with clay has a lot of possibilities, so I'm always learning and making something new. However, I'm more experienced now, so I learned how to manage my time. I learned how to manage my creative blocks. I also learned how to solve problems. I go back home to Lebanon every other year, and I usually stay for six weeks. I like to give something I made, especially because I work here and everybody lives there and they don't get to see or use my work. I learned how to pack efficiently. I only use cardboards and I put them between clothes and I fill my backpack as much as I could handle. My hope is that the people who have a connection to my work, my piece of work will brighten their day a little bit more. Accomplished artists from near and far are showcasing work in communities near you. Here are some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to museums and galleries in your neck of the woods. For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, the new free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. What's more, the Art Rocks website features every episode of this program, so to see or share any episode again, log on to lpb.org and navigate to Art Rocks. Now here's a chance to go into the woods of Wisconsin through the eyes of celebrated landscape painter Tom Utek. Tom's secret? Stealth. 
the Wisconsin native chooses to slow things down, traveling by canoe and on foot to make sure he doesn't miss a thing. The Foliard Gallery in Milwaukee has long been inspired by UTEC's work and he's exhibited there many times. Painting itself and the act of painting is not a goal or an inspiration. It is instead a means to an end. It will permit me to create an image which can transport me and whoever hopefully is looking at it into a state of mind that I really, really like. My name is Tom Utek and um, I'm trying to be an artist. The art that I do is physically, it's paintings and photography. They are allegorical or metaphoric Northwoods landscapes. Well, we're sitting here in Tory Farliard Gallery at a solo show that I currently have, and we have decided to call it The Spirit of the Forest. The works in this exhibition are uh, a continuation of a body of work that uh, I have done now for all of my uh, mature life and most of them are things that are landscapes like this which are uh, based upon my experiences of uh, walking and paddling my canoe around in the uh, northern Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota and Ontario. They are large paintings, they are small paintings, they are different subject matters to some extent within that, within that uh, chosen range. They're definitely on the same track of work that I have been doing for a long time. I go back to the North Country for the inspiration, probably for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them is that's where I grew up and that uh, is in my blood, uh, basically genetically. All of my family has lived up there in the way back in the woods. When they came from Germany, they came from a part of Germany that was similar. So it may be something that you just inherit. The uh, characteristics of the place that I have identified as home are important uh, ingredients that create that sense, I think starting with the glacial evidence of the large uh, amounts of bedrock that are exposed, the large glacial erratic rocks that are laying around the woods, sometimes as big as a house, the evergreen trees, the moss that grows in the ground, the magic of hearing wolves howling at night, the light, it all wraps up into a, a single thing. This is just a, a, an extra special wholeness that is the combination of all of that stuff. And I really discover well, when I show these paintings, and there's a lot of people that share that, that same need. These paintings are not ever paintings about any specific place or any specific time. They're instead a uh, fictional recreation out of representations of real components. Since I'm not using any kind of a references, I start with a piece of charcoal on the canvas, on the bare canvas, and just start looking for what the painting is all about. It usually emerges you know, with a lot of work. And these drawings are, most of the time, are elaborated upon, altered, removed, started over, and so forth. It's a very open experience. Then I have to uh, arrange it in such a way so that the design itself carries most of the meaning that I'm trying to accomplish. And then it's a question of starting to paint it and painting it over and over and over again, uh, you know, many layers. And finally, there will be a moment when you realize that you've got the complete package in front of yourself. Somehow it happens, you just know it when it's there. I won't quit if I just sort of feel like, well, I've got to get something out there. I have learned I can just keep doing it over and over again until I get it right, and I, I don't have to, I don't spend any time at all worrying about destroying something that's good in the process of fixing the whole thing. These paintings are the, in the product of the experience of being in the woods, and one thing that has interested me from the very beginning of my canoe travels is the appearance of and the quality of reflections in the water. It's just a real neat visual thing to see that. 
and I am able to simultaneously see this landscape that I love so much, that interests me so much, up here, and then down at the bottom in the water, I see the same landscape upside down. There is really something incredible and magical about seeing the mirrored landscape. These paintings have often um, encouraged people to stand and look at them for a long time. And I take that single thing as the best compliment that an artist could get. My biggest wish is that they would come here and look at these paintings and want to get the hell out of the gallery as fast as they could and go out in the woods someplace and sit down and experience it themselves. I think of these paintings as having an important environmental, political message that isn't overt. I really do look at them as, uh, as invitations to go out and become uh, involved with and active in uh, natural causes. If you can engage a viewer for a long time, that's what's, um, that's rewarding. A visit to the Massachusetts College of Art and Design during a recent exhibit celebrating the art of poster making will be a trip down memory lane for many. Focusing on trends and fads, the exhibit shines a light on the changing face of pop culture. How intoxicating to sip Campari, to glide over country roads in your Fiat, or to take your leopard out for a stroll. It's all the stuff of style and daring design. The public was slowly being sold this idea that they could do more with their life. Life was not just about work. Life was about enjoying the finer things in life. So they really are selling everything here, including zoos and animals. Yes, there were zoos, and previously there were zoos that only had European animals. But with the you know, new technology, new transportation methods, now we see three zoo posters that are very, very proud of their collections because now they're branching out and they have exotic animals. Lisa Tung is the curator of the new mass art exhibition, A Century of Style, featuring 100 years of posters that pop. It's all the collection of one Massachusetts man with a poster predilection. This is just a fraction of his 500 poster collection. He said that if the hair on the back of his neck stood up, he knew that it was a good one. The proliferation of posters began in the late 1800s. They were all the rage in Paris as they advertised the city's swirling nightlife scenes. For artists like Toulouse-Lautrec and Gustav Klimt, it was a chance to break out. It really gave a lot of fine artists, and at that time fine artists were mainly painters, the freedom to create what they were doing on canvas also for the masses. And so they were able to create beautifully drawn forms and lines. They were the stewards of the florid Art Nouveau movement, but barreling behind was Art Deco, bold and bright, sleek and shimmering. And after the First World War, we have a lot of new technological developments. We have planes, we have trains, we have automobiles, and all of these are bigger and stronger and faster. As much as it was about how to get there, Art Deco showed us where to go to the slopes of San Moritz, to historic Dunkirk on the North Sea, or to the far reaches of exotic Africa. There is now um, a leisured middle class, a white collared worker, who does have time off. And now with these innovative means of travel, can go to uh, you know, this destination that we see on the poster where all the beautiful people are gathering, watching tennis in their you know, tennis whites. But what to wear at night? How about something with a sultry silhouette? Or for the gentleman, imagine yourself sporting well-tailored tweed. There was a company called PKZ, based out of Zurich. They actually held competitions where they would send out a call and anyone could uh, design something for their product. They start um, having a fox, you know, with a little canvas bag, or clothes that look like there's a body in them but hanging on hangers. That is very contemporary uh, back then and it even holds up now. 
of a particular favor, whether it's Art Deco or Art Nouveau or are you the 60s psychedelic pop guy? I, I think it's probably the 60s psychedelic <laughs> pop guy. Yeah, I, I grew up around that time, and so I think I have a, a funny affection for that, actually. David Nelson is the new president of MassArt, which is one of only two publicly funded arts colleges in the country. Nelson came here from the other one in North Carolina. Students who are not just exposed to art, but who are engaged in art have doors of opportunity opened for them. I was that kid. I grew up in a family that wasn't artistic especially, and I begged my parents for a piano. I got a trumpet instead, uh, but I got my hands on that instrument and began playing, and it opened up a new world for me that really shaped the way I've lived my life. The college, which has undergone a campus-wide enhancement over the last six years, is now fundraising to fully renovate its exhibition space to expand its programming. It's the largest free gallery space in New England. Uh, but along with that, uh, there's a special part of that public mission, which is uh, to do outreach to youth and families. And what this does for us is it enables them to see art in an active environment. It's mass art, offering designs on the past, and the future. And lastly, a behind the scenes look at a musical comedy that dares to imagine the writing life and times of the bard himself, William Shakespeare. Let's meet the brothers responsible for the music and the lyrics that drive the much loved musical, Something Rotten. Well, as a wheel, as a wheel, as a wheel. Welcome to 1595. There is a dark force in the arts. He happens to be a blockbuster playwright, crowding out all others. And he has the magnetism of Mick Jagger. William Shakespeare, we hardly knew ye. I am the will with the skill to thrill you with my quill. I am the hard working bard you regard. Yeah. The rollicking musical Something Rotten racked up 10 Tony nominations on Broadway. It centers on the Bottom Brothers, a playwriting duo desperate for a hit outside Shakespeare's shadow. It's quoting Romeo and Juliet. Pathetic. So you've seen it then? Who hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see your last few plays, but they just don't seem to stay in the theaters long enough. One of our first joke ideas was that these two writers went to their agents, William and Morris, and said, hey, you just signed Shakespeare. You know, how are we going to compete with this guy? He just wrote Romeo and Juliet, and the agents say, you're right, we're dropping you. Something Rotten ripened as an idea between brothers Wayne and Carrie Kirkpatrick, who wrote the music and lyrics. We just started running with that idea of what's it like to be in the shadow of Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Both Kirkpatricks are longtime writers who'd never created a musical before. Wayne is a Nashville-based songwriter who won a Grammy for co-writing Eric Clapton's hit, Change the World. When I go to theater, I like to leave the theater and be able to sing the songs that I just heard, you know. And not every approach to theater is like that, but for me, that, that's what I like. I like to look at the program and, oh, I, I can hum that, that song. Carrie is a songwriter and screenwriter of a slew of animated hits, including Chicken Run. I don't want to be a pie. I don't like gravy. In plays, you can be more, a little bit more dialogue driven, and it's more about conversations uh, between people, and you're less dependent on visual storytelling as you are in movies. The brothers tested their comedic edge in Something Rotten, in which the Bottom Brothers, trying to outdo Shakespeare, search out a soothsayer to clue them in to theater's next big hit. Musical! What the hell are musicals? It appears to be a play where the dialogue stops and the plot is conveyed through song. Through song? Yes! So, so, so an actor <laughs> is saying his lines yeah. and then out of nowhere he just starts singing? Yeah! <laughs> well, that is the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. Do you love musicals or do you hate musicals? We love musicals. Yes. Yeah. We grew up, we both grew up, I was in theater all through high school, and so was Carrie. And um, yeah, we have a, a deep love and appreciation for it. I get why some people don't get it. The whole breaking into song in the middle of the 
conversation. Some people don't do that. We do. <laughs> yes. I do that in every part of my at dinner. Every day. Yeah. Joining the brothers in writing the show's book is Carrie's Chicken Run collaborator, John O'Farrell, a British author who found himself cooped up with the Kirkpatricks. At 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock, we went to the pub. I thought, great, we've done our day's work. I had a pint of Guinness, great, another pint of Guinness. And then they went, so this bit in Act 2. And I went, oh no, we're still working. <laughs> I, thought, I thought we'd stopped. I'm having a drink now. Because it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's really, it's really hard. People were coming to our show not really knowing what it was, and they, uh, it crept up on them. You know, this show is going to go out all across America, and people are going to discover it uh, in all these great cities. And, you know, our mission in 2017 is to make America laugh again. <laughs> the fraternity has been a fruitful one. The show is a rarity, an original musical written by first-timers that went directly to Broadway and became a hit. Then again, maybe a soothsayer saw it for them, too. And that'll do it for another edition of Art Rocks. But as you know, you can always find, watch and share episodes of the show at lpb.org slash Art Rocks. And if you want to know more about the culture that surrounds you, Country Roads Magazine makes a great resource for finding out what's going on in the arts all across the state. So until next week, I've been James Fox Smith, and thanks to you for watching.